Okay, well, I think it's close enough to 11.30. And uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, last session before lunch. So that everybody will be on edge and ready to, to pounce. Uh, my name is Stan Chubbs. Uh, I work for Mentor Graphics, uh, the uh, so-called code sorcery division of, uh, of Mentor, uh, Mark Mitchell's company, which was bought a couple of years ago and absorbed into Mentor's uh, embedded software division that includes accelerated technology guys and, and a bunch of others uh, absorbed companies whose names I don't remember. And actually, most recently, we uh, picked up uh, uh, Monta Vista's automotive Linux guys uh, taking them off Cavium's hands because really Cavium's a networking company, didn't want to do uh, automotive. So anyway, I'll uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, GB work that's been uh, uh, ongoing and uh, gradually progressing from the uh, uh, things that actually work to uh, raw dough that your mother warned you not to eat. So. The, uh, just as a start, as a, as a background, uh, GEB, uh, GNU Debugger, it's been a part of uh, the GNU system uh, since around 1986 or so, when it actually first appeared as a subdirectory in the GNU Emacs distribution. Um, we don't actually have much history going back that far because uh, no one actually had source control or, or uh, kept very much track or even said anything about what they were doing, just kind of showed up. It originally was just set up to be a, a native debugger for Unix-type systems. Um, got early on extended for uh, cross-debugging and has since gone through a number of major uh, redesigns and rewrites. Uh, target vector, uh, which I'll talk about more in a bit, as an abstraction for the back end. Uh, objects to represent uh, uh, frames, stack frames. Uh, GB Arch to represent uh, target architectures as, as objects rather than piles of macros, as is familiar even today for people that work with uh, GCC. And in fact, uh, just to, as, as an amusement, a couple of times I've done a diff of the lines from an earliest version of GCC to nowadays, and there's literally just a couple pages worth of lines that are actually still the same. And uh, so, Pretty much everything has been worked over. And it's been the uh, default uh, debugger for Linux since forever. Um, there is a work on an LLVM debugger called LLDB, and it's a possible successor. It uh, uh, needs regular patching to uh, uh, be made to work on uh, uh, Linux. Uh, Apple uses it as their default debugger now um, as part of Xcode. But uh, unsurprisingly, Apple is not quite as energetic about maintaining the Linux port. So just a, a quick uh, review of the uh, uh, overall uh, big picture of how it's put together. The, uh, at the top, we have the uh, uh, different user interfaces, command line interface, the machine interface, which is kind of a more heavily sugared version of the uh, command line interface that uh, Eclipse uses, uh, GBTK, a GUI, and uh, TUI, which is a terminal user interface, which is a, a, a sort of a curses-based interface. On the, uh, uh, the one side, uh, we have uh, the, the so-called symbol side, and this is all symbol table handling. The, uh, uh, BFD is the main intake library. This is what actually knows how the uh, uh, object files look. And it dumps uh, basically blocks of raw symbol data um, into handlers for different file formats. And with, at this point, pretty much ELF is really the only live one. There used to be a lot more. And then uh, also the, uh, an add-on for the symbolic information, which is kind of an M by N with the uh, symbol information, although not entirely. Um, so in theory, you could have A dot out format with dwarf information and weird stuff like that. Um, in practice, really, mostly what people do nowadays, it's elf and dwarf. The, uh, uh, on the other side, we have the, the specifics uh, of the, how you interact with uh, targets. So for instance, Linux NAT is the code that does Linux native specifically. Exec is uh, short for the uh, getting information out of an executable. 
So for instance, if you wanted to read a initialized variable uh, before running a program, you can. You just print the value and it, it digs it out of the executable, treating it as if it were a target system. Similarly for core files. Um, there's a whole bunch of other protocols for cross debugging, and, but the star of the show is uh, remote.c, which has never been given a name. It's people will say the remote protocol or RSP or whatever. Um, actually, a lot of times I just call it the remote.c protocol because that's the, that's the file it's from. But anyway, that's the default uh, remote debugging protocol, and then it has a lower level uh, that can go through TCP or Unix or whatever. And then on the target side, if you're not talking to the target directly somehow, um, there's a GDB server that say, is very often used in the embedded Linux case where GDB server sits on the target and it does the target side of the remote protocol. The other uh, pieces, uh, we have a, a, sense of a collection of languages uh, language support does parsing, that sort of thing. Um, and then GDB Arch objects, which define things like what's the, uh, the byte pattern of the trap instruction, uh, how do you take apart a prolog, um, how do you interpret uh, uh, a stack frame, and so forth. And then finally, in the middle, is the execution control. And this is what actually implements the, uh, the algorithms uh, that are the, at the heart of debugging. So to take an example, um, the single step process. Single step um, at an instruction level is basically goes straight through. You say step I or SI, and it basically sends a single command to the target, and then the target does whatever is target specific to single step. Um, for instance, at Linux native, that amounts to a single ptrace call. The, uh, but to say single step by source lines, there's actually an iterative process, a single steps by an instruction, reads the PC back, goes back to the symbol table and says, is the PC now pointing to a different source line? If it points to a different source line, it says, oh, I'm done with single stepping. So uh, that's actually one of the reasons that the uh, uh, single stepping optimized code is funny, because the compiler has taken the single source line and scattered bits of it all over the, uh, the program. And so the GDB algorithm just blindly says, oh, it's a different source line, not realizing it was actually the same source line you were at a moment ago, and just jumps you back there. So that's the execution control is all about those, those kind of algorithms. So the target system trends, um, as, as we saw yesterday, um, lots and lots and lots of Linux targets. You know, we're up in the, you know, probably over a billion out there now. Uh, it goes everything from the low, f uh, low end, the phones, the tablets, the gadgets, to the middle end, which is these uh, automotive systems, infotainment systems, which are um, more or less desktop sized, but they're not actual desktops. And then we have the high end, the uh, backbone switches and uh, compute farms and so on, that are, are pretty big iron. And desktop, yes, all the enthusiasts have desktop Linux and nobody else does. So uh, uh, coming down to the multi-core aspect of it, right now, 2 to 16 cores is pretty commonplace. Uh, different people have different uh, numbers of cores. We go around the room and look at everybody's laptops. You know, there's, there's anywhere from 2 to, two to 8. Um, desktops will have more. Um, in the lab, though, um, as with Activa, Teller, and, and so forth, there's quite a few uh, higher numbers of cores being experimented with. Um, and I didn't, there's actually uh, some thousand core systems that have been kicked around, although some of them cheat and they're actually like uh, uh, hyper threaded for a thousand threads. Um, and it's really not that many, uh, not quite as many physical cores. This has some implications for debugging. Um, because you have a lot more stuff going on in the target, a lot more stuff going on simultaneously. Um, and there's a number of approaches we could take to this. Uh, one approach is to do nothing. Uh, you say the kernel conceals the fact that there are multiple cores, it allocates the threads to the cores in whatever uh, way it feels like, and GDB already knows how to do threads, and Ptrace does the, the hard work of connecting the uh, threads to the, the debugger. So you're good. Um, 
This isn't necessarily a great approach. It starts to break down uh, as the number of cores increases. Um, one of the things that can happen is you have an application that has core affinities. So you'll have uh, 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 threads that are actually allocated to specific cores, and you could have a situation where, say, there's a, a bug in the system, and the uh, one core is, is being good and the other core is being flaky, and it's the fact that there, or the, the threads are on particular cores is where the, the root cause of the problem. Uh, there's also designs that we saw a couple yesterday that people were putting up on the, on the screen showing uh, heterogeneous cores where they may all be ARMs, but you have like uh, uh, A4s in the, as a sort of a compute fabric and then an A9 as a main processor. So the, uh, another thing, uh, thing that starts to happen is, is as you have many more cores, you can have many more threads than you had before. Um, and so another approach that we'll talk about in a little bit is to generalize the commands to operate on sets of threads um, or sets of cores rather than one at a time. And then finally, in the most extreme case, um, we can start shifting work to the target. So instead of having the host GDB have to do everything and have the, an immense amount of traffic uh, going to and from it, the, uh, the, to shift that somehow, get it off the network and get it onto the target somehow. And I'll go more in a little bit uh, uh, about what all that means. So to, as, as the, the illustration of uh, what's going on here, so in a single core system with a bunch of threads, what's really happening, um, it doesn't overwhelm the debugger even if you have a lot of threads because ultimately everything is running once at a time. And so the X's here indicate uh, breakpoint hits. That even if you have the breakpoint that all the threads hit, the breakpoint is really still only being hit one at a time. And there's a little bit of uh, interval between one and the next. And uh, could even be lo long intervals if they, uh, there's, there's other activities going on. Plus which, if GDB is running native on that system, some of the gaps in between the threads running is where GDB itself is being swapped in and is uh, essentially throttling the, the rate at which uh, the breakpoints are hit. But if you have a four core system, you know, those breakpoints could all be hit literally simultaneously. So now you have four requests for breakpoint handling showing up to GDB at exactly the same moment. And you know, what do you do about that? You end up with a, uh, you can end up with sort of a congested system uh, all wrapped around uh, with, with GDB as the bottleneck. So the first thing that, uh, that is, this is, uh, this is in the category of something that actually already works, um, is to uh, only try and, and operate on one thread at a time. Uh, the old GB behavior was to stop the entire system. And, and if you think back, 1986, there wasn't a whole lot of thread programming going on. So the, uh, uh, so the entire process was brought to a halt, and you stepped and then brought it all to a halt again. Um, and this sort of generally works for threads, except for all the real-time threads that time out because you're sitting at a breakpoint. Um, so the, uh, several years ago, we introduced this uh, uh, non-stop mode where you can leave a number of the threads running and just start and stop an individual thread. You can still ask to interrupt all the threads. You can still ask to uh, um, uh, just stop one thread and then continue all the others and so forth. So this has been available uh, for some time. I don't know, how, does, how many people actually use this or have used this mode? Yeah, I had a feeling it was, uh, it's not been widely advertised. Um, the, uh, the way it works is um, uh, you can't do the usual dance of, of removing the, the trap instruction for the breakpoint, reinserting it. Because the, even if it's only one instruction that you're, you're single stepping past, if you have a whole bunch of other threads running through, they could all sort of escape and get past the breakpoint at that moment. So we added a, a back end thing to GDB to uh, do the so called display stepping. So the way that works is we leave the trap instruction in place, 
but it, the instruction that it was uh, overwritten, uh, we copy it over to a different location. Uh, we modify it if it's at all position dependent. And uh, for instance, uh, say a relative memory reference. <coughs> and then after that, there's a, a jump back to the, uh, the following instruction if necessary. If the instruction being written over is a uh, jump instruction, then we just modify the target of the jump. So, uh, so this allows the, uh, the trap instructions to stay in place continuously and to, to catch all of the, uh, the, the hits. So the, the user interface um, for this uh, 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 multiple thread situation is still basically a one thread at a time kind of operation. Um, even the nonstop mode where you can say continue all the threads or stop all the threads, you do still have to say either all the threads or just one of them. And if you say you wanted to step one thread and then another, you actually have to switch to the a thread uh, using a, the thread command, step it, switch to a different thread, step it, switch to a different thread, step it, and so forth. Um, if the threads are at all organized or coordinated anyway, um, you get kind of a chaotic situation where eventually the program makes forward progress, but its behavior is not at all like what it, how it works in real life. So if everything is, is interlocked in a way that <clears throat> there's no timing dependencies, um, this kind of sort of works. Uh, if there's any interdependencies, you'll get so many timeouts that this essentially becomes unusable. Um, and so uh, it's the kind of thing that will work fine for a worker in a consumer thread, um, maybe a couple worker threads, but anything past that, uh, it just really breaks down. So the proposed change to this is to extend the GDB commands to work on sets. And this is uh, uh, being a little bit vague about what the sets are actually called because we've had a couple different uh, versions of the name. Um, we've managed to generate all kinds of confusion and we haven't even finished implementing it yet. But the, uh, the general theory uh, is that it consists of the thread, the set is consists of processes.threads at cores. And this is a fairly general uh, uh, framework in that you can uh, explicitly name the threads or processes. You can explicitly name, uh, you can specify them by ranges. You can use predicates, you can do set operations of the usual sorts. And then you can define name sets and then use those in commands. So just to give a couple examples, the, um, you want to say all threads of a particular PID, say 4563.star. Um, you can specify that to say tie it down to a specific subset of cores. Say you have 40 cores, you only want to look at the first 20. Um, you can add an apt uh, notation. And I, 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 in case anybody's wondering why they're in different colors, um, it's because at sign wasn't a great choice for uh, doing PowerPoint type presentations because all the software thinks it's an email address. <laughs> so, <laughs> and in fact, it's horribly difficult to edit it because it really, really wants to treat it as a single object. And it's like, thank you, presentation software. Anyway, so that's, there's no deeper significance to that. Um, and for some reason, LibreOffice doesn't really know about quoting either. Otherwise, they put some backslashes in or something. Um, anyway, so the, uh, uh, another possibility is if you had name threads, you could say something like star dot signal shaper, and that would actually designate the same uh, thread of the same name among a whole set of processes. Okay, so you had a situation where you forked several processes, um, and they're all <clears throat> generally the same, uh, same, so the same threads within them. You could set a breakpoint that would actually apply to all the processes. Mm. Um, a, a mechanism as yet undetermined. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of theoretical aspect. We, well, there's a kind of a, a POSIX thing where you can apply a name to a thread and it's but nobody, has that. nobody has that. That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is, we're getting, this, this is why I say it's getting a little bit closer to the, the into the half-baked range. Um, there are, there are targets, uh, RTOS and so forth, that do have named threads that are built in as uh, part of their design. 
And the, um, another part of the set notation is that you can just omit things. So you can omit, say, the, if you just want to refer to the current process, you can just omit the process specification and just say 1-20. And uh, so to get some examples, the, uh, the original uh, uh, idea I had for this actually was to use kind of a square bracket notation as, the, uh, as a prefix to the commands. And, uh, and it turns out the Swedes didn't like that at all. You say, well, why the Swedish? Well, if you've ever seen a Swedish keyboard, uh, doing a square bracket is not easy. So they didn't really like the idea that you'd have to do a square bracket in front of every command to, to do mul uh, multiple core commands. So, uh, so f at the moment, it's been left a little bit vague as to uh, uh, what the final syntax is going to be. Um, so <clears throat> for the purpose of concreteness here, I'm, just, I'm using this as an argument to, this, to the commands, um, since that's something that, that we can fit into the GEB syntax. So our first example, single step, all threads of all processes that are currently attached to core six. So that, that would be if the, the, uh, <clears throat> any process that had their affinity set to core six, and so that, that's the one they were using. Um, should be able to do something like it continue, specify a specific set of threads, uh, include both by numbers and names if you can't remember, uh, if the, say the thread named worker is given different numbers, um, depending on the, uh, the uh, the way the thread allocation works. So, uh, so this particular continue command solves this problem of having to uh, start individual threads one at a time and, uh, and get into the ordering difficulties. Um, we have an a existing command, uh, existing modification to the break command where you can say break, give a function, then specify a thread. Uh, but right now, uh, it's currently limited. You can only resume a particular thread, the breakpoint can only be attached to a particular thread. Uh, this is not very easy to use if you want that breakpoint to trigger on several threads, but not all of them. So this will be a, uh, this set notation gives us a, a way to fix that uh, long-standing problem. So the uh, the whole set idea is actually not uh, original with with anybody in the GDB world. This actually came from a, a, a total view and was a quasi-standard for this uh, high-performance debugging forum that uh, uh, was briefly active in the uh, mid to late 90s. Uh, and they actually produced a sort of a standard, um, and then the whole project kind of disappeared. So it, it's, uh, you can actually find the H HPDF spec out on the net, and I think we made a copy onto the, uh, the <clears throat> GDB wiki just for uh, documentation purposes. But in any case, to see a real live example, you can actually uh, uh, go look at the uh, Total Views uh, manual, and uh, and they actually have a, a very similar notation uh, worked out in great detail. So, so I originally put this idea up in, uh, for GDB in, in a couple of years ago, and uh, first calling them process thread sets as an HPDF, and then there was interest in doing this for cores. Um, mostly in kind of in an embedded context where the cores were not all homogenous. And uh, so we extend that to call them PTC sets, process thread core sets. And then the uh, implementation says, well, you know, in GDB we generalize this to call them inferiors. And, uh, and in general we call the, uh, the processes that GDB is operating on inferiors. Um, and you know, the, the traditional belief is that they're called that because the, the child of the forked process is called an inferior process, but actually in the debugger world we call them the inferior processes because, well, they're inferior, right? They have bugs. If they didn't have bugs, we wouldn't be running them in the debugger. So uh, <laughs> by definition, and they're, they're all inferior processes compared to GDB. So anyway, so that was the idea to call them uh, uh, inferior thread sets, uh, or IT sets for short. Um, and um, in retrospect, that probably wasn't a great choice because really the, uh, an embedded system, uh, sort of a bare metal target, uh, is an inferior in the GDB sense, but it's not really a process. So it's kind of, uh, it's a little bit confused and it hasn't been decided what we're really going to call them. In any case, uh, uh, Pedro Alves worked hard on this and um, 
and got a, a work in progress pushed onto a GEB branch. Um, and then he couldn't take it anymore, and so he escaped from Mentor to go to Red Hat and uh, left the work behind. <laughs> and, uh, and there's been a little bit of work on the infrastructure since then. Um, and the, the reason there's the, the, while the data structure is the data structure for set operations is relatively straightforward, the, a lot of the old code in execu the execution control in GDB is still has a lot of implicit assumptions about the, uh, the single threading of control. And so that essentially needs to be rewritten to, uh, to accommodate the possibility of multiple uh, threads running simultaneously. And so that's been going on. It's not been not real speedy. Um, we've got an update patch that uh, Yao Qi has been working on. He's uh, been holding it off until uh, uh, 7.6 has been released so that everybody doesn't get distracted. So check our team. OK, so that's the, uh, that's the set stuff. And uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll see, it, see it before the end of, uh, end of the, the new millennium. <coughs> Anyway, so I made reference before the host as a bottleneck. And GDB is really like a duck. When you do the single step command, um, I mean, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Um, the uh, getting a register, if you ever turn on the, the debugging, uh, any of the debug remote uh, uh, flags, and you can see just how much traffic is going back and forth. And so there's a lot of reading of pieces of memory, looking at the piece of memory, saying, well, I should dereference that because it's actually a stack pointer. Let me go get a piece of stack. That's referring to another variable. Oh, I need to go get that. And it pretty much does everything one at a time. And if you had a single core target, even with multiple threads, as, a, as the diagram earlier showed, since only one thread at a time is really needing attention, every, all the other threads are suspended, and they don't have to do this traffic back and forth. So there's a, there's a nice self-throttling effect. So even if there's a lot of traffic, um, your uh, single-step performance isn't really degraded. But again, on a multi-core system, if the same thing happens, you're going to have hundreds of threads hitting that same breakpoint. They're all wanting the same kind of attention. Um, you now have a huge number of, uh, of packets or ptrace calls. Um, even though a ptrace call is native, you still have to switch the context of the OS dig stuff out of the other process, and then switch context back. So even if there's not network traffic, there's still the, uh, 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 the you still have a bottleneck type situation. So the idea is to get the, that the host out of the critical path by moving work to the target somehow. And so it's a little bit of a, of a strange idea. It's, um, it was partly inspired by the uh, trace point work that we, uh, that we did several years ago um, in which you uh, essentially can collect data without stopping the program. So the uh, GEB sets up the trace points, installs them on the target, um, the, the target does all the work, and then later on you collect the data, you go back and, and pick up the data that you collected. And so the... Um, uh, uh, the, the aspect, the, the way this works then is that you have some kind of an agent. So this original stub is just, you know, get a byte, return it. But now the agent then can do more work. Um, and in fact, it got, with the trace points, it actually got as far as, as designing a small bytecode engine and sticking it in the agent. Um, because you had, uh, say, complicated variables, you had to calculate an offset uh, based on the data type of the variable, say an array. And so you needed some way to do the computation on the target side without getting GDB involved. So anyway, so the uh, so ways to do the, uh, this, this target agent now that's doing more work, you could do a static link. Um, we did this for one uh, customer. And, uh, and the, the program had seven threads, and we added an eighth thread. And the eighth thread was actually a, a, a debugging stub, and it controlled the... Uh, uh, other seven threads with signals. And so it, uh, it worked really well. It's unfortunate that we couldn't uh, give it out to the world. It was very customized to, to their application. But it was, uh, it was a nice little scheme where the, uh, the program didn't require a GDB server. The, the, uh, there was no context switching required because the, uh, 
Oh, you've got to be kidding me. I don't want to do that. That Linux software. <laughs> well, we'll see, how, we'll see how long this lasts. Um, okay, yeah, so anyway, so, so one way to do it is to statically link in a, uh, uh, to a dedicated thread. Another way, and this is what actually GDB server does now, is that it, uh, it has a copy of the agent, or more exactly, it has two copies of the agent, one which sits in GDB server and a second copy which sits in the application as a dynamically loaded library. And so it, it kind of manages all that behind the scenes. So this is actually not a totally new idea. Uh, we've had sometime in the, the, about five, ten years ago, uh, we introduced a Z packet uh, to the remote protocol to set breakpoints. And what it did was it moved the breakpoint trap management to the target. So instead of having to go back and forth inserting the, uh, reading the instruction underneath the trap instruction, inserting a trap instruction, inserting the, reinserting the original instruction, you send a single packet to the target and it does the rest of the work. Somewhat more recently, we actually took this uh, uh, to the, the breakpoint conditions. So you have a, something that looks like break foo.c line 45, but only if global variable is more than 92. And the way this works in, in, um, uh, by default is that the, uh, the breakpoint is always hit comes back to GDB. GDB evaluates the global variable comparison, uh, which means that it's pulling the data from the global variable. And then if the condition is false, then GDB continues on. So again, duck style, um, all this chatter is going back and forth, and the ultimate result is the program continues. Well, OK, it continues after having had its time wasted for some fraction of a second. So again, coming back to the 100 threads, you have 100 threads all marking time, waiting for their uh, condition to be evaluated. Um, it goes from you know, an unnoticeable nuisance to uh, everything is dead in the water for you know, a noticeable amount of time. So we introduced these uh, target side breakpoints. Uh, we borrowed the trace point mechanism, compiles the conditional code to byte codes, uh, sends it on down. and. Um, and again, with the help of the suitable target agent, which includes GDB server, it can do that uh, all by itself. So uh, it can't do everything. So for instance, if you have a reference to a convenience variable, which is only maintained inside GDB, it still has to come back to the host for that. But for a lot of, of kinds of real life conditions, it works pretty well. And now it's actually been in and uh, was in the last release of GDB, GDB 7.5. So anyway, so now we're getting to the really uh, uh, unbaked material. Um, so a lot of this stuff is, is all based around trying to hack up the remote protocol and trying to redesign how things work. Now, this protocol was really designed for 68,000 uh, debugging over a serial line running at 1,200 baud. And you could only assume there was a few kilobytes of memory on the target that was even available for you to work with. So if you've ever looked at the example stubs and GDB sources, um, you'll see some effort has been made to make them as small as possible and do as little as possible. So literally it's brought down to the single letter command G to get all registers, which is all fine for a 68,000 or an x86. Um, it's really not so good for a power PC or a, uh, 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 an arm with a, a whole bunch of optional register units all loaded up. And, uh, or for, say, an Extensa, which has uh, 2,000 uh, bit registers and lots of them. So uh, the, the G packet has to return everything. So, the, uh, so and to reiterate, we've sent lots of back, uh, packets, even to do a simple backtrace. We've got all the overheads. And then we multiply that by a number of cores. So it's kind of a situation where doing a, a thin protocol doesn't really seem like it was a, a, a great idea anymore. So as part of that, um, the multi-core association, who uh, the originators of MPI and, uh, and then the common trace format, um, has had a working group now for about a year or so uh, 
developing a general services framework um, aimed at mo mainly at, uh, debugging and tracing and that sort of thing. And, uh, and it's not a very open group. That is, anybody can join, uh, can participate, but they don't put anything out of the net, which I don't entirely agree with. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so this is just me speaking. There, there's really no, been no actual standard put forth. It's still at the discussion point. Um, the general requirements. I see all the Anna Smirk in there. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. I'm going to get to you. Um, so anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the general expectations that it would be cross-platform, cross-technology. Um, there's a desire to have a discovery. So that is, instead of having to know what the target is ahead of time, that you can essentially, it can essentially go out of the net and pick out uh, uh, fine targets that are, are amenable to debugging. Uh, and of course, this is also part of the, the secret plan for world domination because you know lots of Cisco routers have GDB backdoors in them already, so it'd be handy to like discover them all at once. Uh, the protocol needs to to have a high performance, and it's not so much for debugging because as much as I talk about the traffic, we're still talking about you know several hundreds or maybe several uh, tens of kilobytes of data. Um, but the Air Client is tracing uh, uh, tools that can dump, you know, multiple gigabytes in a real hurry. Um, and then another part of this is just that we want to coordinate uh, different host tools. Right now, uh, there's a little bit of a difficulty if, say, GDB is trying to control the target and something like LTGNG is trying to return trace data. Um, if the target is stopped because you said stop in GDB, um, LTGNG is not getting its data. So in the, in the GDB context, to the extent that we figured out what this is going to look like, um, one thing uh, I think we, we would like to do is to ha extend the, uh, uh, the target command to have URIs. So here we say MCSF is a protocol. We can do kind of a slashes as the routing to an actual target. And then the, uh, the PTC sets could actually be an argument to the uh, 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 coming out at the end of the URI. So in this case, process 456 and all its threads. The uh, uh, thing is service-oriented, so there's a number of services, and the services are defined uh, by the target. And for debugging, it, it seems to boil down to about four main services that you need. And the first is to get state, uh, set it, ex execution control, and then instrumentation pretty much subsumes everything that uh, uh, is going to run independently, breakpoints, watch points, and so forth. And the key thing here that makes it different from the old remote protocol is that something like the get um, is allowed to have an arbitrarily complex set of arguments. So in this case, I threw out as an example, get register 0 from, uh, through uh, 7 from cores 1 through 6, memory location 2, and then 16 bytes after location, memory location 3. And all of this is essentially a single packet, and the target does all the work to compose that up, you know, however large that is, returns it all at once. So we go from a situation where we have uh, dozens of packets to just one. So that's the, uh, that's the theory. This actually hasn't been implemented. Um, so here's the artist conception in the way that the uh, hypothetical things have the amazing artist conception that makes you think how it's really going to work. Um, so we have like two host tools, uh, Mesa's Mentor's uh, Sorcery Analyzer tool, which is really an Eclipse uh, uh, wrapper for uh, a trace tool like LTTGNG. And then it can talk to proxies, and proxies are essentially the, the just communication forwardings to uh, other targets. And then, um, uh, and this uh, subsumes things like uh, JTAG probes and so forth. And then f to look deeper into a target, the uh, uh, target can have an agent, and agent has a bytecode engine, and then the cores are either talking to the bytecode engine, that is, they're not interacting with GDB, and then hopefully just from time to time, a core actually needs to uh, interact with GDB, and so it'll connect through to the host. So, uh, yes, this is a more complicated agent. So anyway, um, that's the, uh, the general picture, and now we're really at the, at the raw stuff. 
So uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to solicit some reactions. <laughs>